You're listening to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast, episode 38, hosted by me, Robert Plotkin. Today, I'm going to be speaking with Grace Smith, a hypnotherapist, about the similarities and differences between meditation and hypnosis, and about how hypnotherapy can be used to address problems of technological distraction and addiction. Grace is a world-renowned hypnotherapist and the founder of the Grace Method Hypnotherapy School. Her private clients include many celebrities, CEOs, professional athletes, and government officials. And her first book on self-hypnosis, Close Your Eyes, Get Free, was released in July of 2018 and is on sale now. You can find out more about Grace at gshypnosis.com. We're extremely pleased to welcome Grace Smith to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. In the interview that you're about to hear, Grace Smith will talk about some of the similarities and differences between meditation and hypnosis. And I thought that that was a good reminder of something that will be today's tip, which is a little bit different than some of the other tips I've given. This one is really just a a general reminder that there are many, many different ways to address the problems that we all face with technology to engage in more healthy and productive and and focused ways with technology. And although at Technology for Mindfulness, we often talk about meditation as one way, I often mention lessons from martial arts as another way. Uh, We often talk about new apps that you can use or ways that you can configure your devices. Uh, None of these are necessarily better than others or are the quote right way uh, to uh, make your own life better. Sometimes when I speak to people about mindfulness, they tell me in somewhat embarrassed tones that they can't meditate or they've tried meditating as if it's some kind of confession that they feel the need to tell me uh, when really I don't have any judgment about that. It's not that meditation is somehow the one exalted method. And you know, even in Buddhist teachings, it's said that there are 84,000 doors <laughs> to enlightenment. And I've always taken that to mean there are many, many ways to improve ourselves, to gain insight. And uh, although meditation, I found and many people find is a very valuable way, uh, it's important to remember that there are many ways and that what works for you may be different than what works for other people. And in fact, what works for you in one situation may be different than what works for you in a different situation or at a different time. Uh, So I think the upcoming interview with Grace Smith, in which she focuses on hypnosis, is a really great uh, reminder of this fact that there are many different techniques and strategies and approaches we can use uh, generally in our lives and also specifically uh, to address issues relating to technology and anxiety, stress, focus, productivity, creativity, and all the other topics we uh, talk about at Technology for Mindfulness. I hope you find that reminder helpful, and I hope you enjoy the upcoming interview with Grace Smith. Hi, Grace, and welcome to the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Today, I'd like to talk to you about uh technological distraction and addiction and anxiety, and particularly how it relates to your expertise, which is in hypnosis and self-hypnosis, which may be topics that our listeners don't know a lot about. So I wonder if you could just give people a little bit of an introduction to hypnosis 
uh, including maybe some common myths that are out there, uh, misunderstandings, and then how how you've learned to apply this to uh, the problems we have with technology. Absolutely. So first and foremost, there will be no swinging watches or clucking chickens here today. <laughs> this is not what you'll find on a Vegas stage show or in a Hollywood movie. So hypnosis is, I call it meditation with a goal. And essentially what it is, is relaxing down into the theta brainwave state, the same place you reach in deep meditation. And when you're in the theta brainwave state, you feel deeply relaxed and perfectly safe. And because you feel deeply relaxed and perfectly safe, have the surplus energy required to create new connections in the brain very quickly. You also become more open to suggestions, but you only become open to suggestions that you want to absorb. Now, one of the biggest myths about hypnosis is that it's mind control. And once I tell you these two examples as to how it's not mind control, you'll say, oh, that's so, it's just common sense. That just makes sense. But we've been told the opposite for so long in Hollywood that uh, these common sense truths sometimes don't come up. So first things first, if hypnosis were mind control, every hypnotist on the planet would be a billionaire. <laughs> and then everyone on the planet would want to be a hypnotist. <laughs> and that certainly is not the case. I have yet to meet one billionaire hypnotherapist or hypnotist. Secondly, if hypnosis were mind control, every major company on the planet that had a product to sell hire hypnotists to get on their commercial and hypnotize everyone watching the commercial to go buy the product. So then instead of binging on whatever you're watching at night, you'd be getting up every few minutes to run to the car, start the ignition and go buy something you didn't want or need. Uh, it is most certainly not mind control. In fact, how much you want the result is the one indicator of how successful the session will be. So an example, if someone comes to me and says, I really want to quit smoking, Grace, but I don't quote unquote believe in hypnosis. I say, great, close your eyes. We'll knock this out in two or three sessions max because there's no belief system required. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This isn't faith-based. This is just a scientifically proven fact that we go into the theta state and can create these connections faster. But if someone came to me and said, Grace, I believe in hypnosis and I love it. I know I should quit smoking, but I don't want to. I'd say it's going to be a waste of my time and your money. Come back when you want to quit because you will not absorb suggestions that you don't want to absorb. So when we apply this to what our discussion will be about today, cell phone use and really addiction to cell phones also are linked to addiction to social media, video games, and those notifications on email apps and things like Slack. You have to realize you want the result in order to experience it. So similarly, I've had a lot of parents in recent, especially in the last eight months, it's been picking up um, parents coming and saying, can you help my child? They're addicted to video games. And I'll say, I'd love to, I really would. But unless they want to quit, we're not going to see the results you're looking for. And that always holds true. If the child gets to the point where they're saying, this is ruining my life. I need to get a hold of this as you would with any addiction. Um, the results are phenomenal. And we'll talk a bit about what you can expect. But if the child is 16 years old, has no interest in stopping playing the games in the middle of the night with people all over the world, um, the results are not going to be there. Yeah, that's great. And I'll just say briefly, I have had one experience with uh, being hypnotized. If you even call, I don't even know if you call it being hypnotized. Uh, maybe that's not the right word. Uh, but I, I have a colleague who I had shown some, uh, I, I led him through some guided meditations in person. I, I sat there and I, I spoke, uh, you know, I use my own voice. And he said, you know, this is very interesting because I'm a certified hyp hypnotherapist. And this reminded me a lot of hypnosis, the guided meditation. And I was surprised to hear that because I think I had these Hollywood uh, influence beliefs about hypnosis. He said, oh, would you ever be interested in, in being hypnotized? I said, yes. So we did one session and the experience was very much like what you said. I'd almost call it underwhelming in a way. Yes, you know? exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I, I could, I could see the benefit of it, but it was not at all what I 
expected from Hall. I didn't feel under his control at all. I didn't feel like I, w- I was fully present, aware of everything that was happening. I could have stopped at any time. Uh, you know, it, it was very, very different than what I had uh, been, been led to believe from stage shows. While at the same time, I could see the power of it. And it did remind me very, very much of you know, just a guided uh, meditation. Uh, I could see this. I could see the similarity between the two. I'd encourage anyone who you know is curious about it or has any of these misconceptions to just experience it for themselves, because I don't think anything can substitute for for having the experience in order to get a better understanding of it. I agree. And if there's time at the end, we could always do a quick group hypnosis for about three to five minutes. So if that's of interest, it's something we could plan to fit in at the end there. Sure. Well, yeah, maybe you can start talking a bit about how you uh, have been able to apply this to things like video game, uh, internet addiction, distraction, attention problems, you know, anything else relating to technology. And I know you mentioned parents and children. I don't know if you've noticed anything uh, different about how this uh, uh, applies to young people rather than to adults. You know, what, what have you found? Absolutely. I found that if an adult is coming to me or one of the other hypnotherapists at our company, Grace Based Hypnosis, that their results are always very successful. Because if an adult is coming to us, it's because they know that they have a problem. They're the one paying for the sessions. So they have a greater literal investment in the results. Whereas with children, oftentimes, and and by children, I mean, we've been having clients come in now as young as six for internet addiction, Mm. um, all the way up through the teenage years when they're not going to be paying for the sessions themselves and the desire, because they really do believe that this is part of their, how they're social. And we found that this is very much not the case that a lot of times using social media and uh, video games causes us to become more isolated and to avoid social situations less. But young children who were brought up in this era of always being connected to a device feel like their friends are online and to give that up would be to give up their friendships. Mm -hmm. And it has been quite heartbreaking with children. um, A lot of the times to see that it's probably going to take a little bit longer for them to have the desire to stop in order to see these improved results. Um, So I'll talk first a little bit about the successes we've seen with adults. And then we have had one or two cases with younger people that are really inspiring. Um, So let's talk about just Something called, I was I was doing a bit of um, catching up on my research before our call today to see what articles have come out about this in the news, because I know my experience direct with my clients, but there's this overarching growth of addiction to cell phones happening in the world from people who haven't yet turned to hypnosis. So I wouldn't know what their experience is like personally, but there's something literally called nomophobia. And it's real. And it was written about in an article on CNN called Smartphone Addiction Could Be Changing Your Brain. Nomophobia is no access to having your phone. Mm -hmm. And I think that if everyone listening were to imagine that I said you can't have access to your cell phone for the next 24 hours, there would be varying degrees of anxiety from every single person. This is a real Mm -hmm. thing. (laughs) Even I feel a twinge of like, "Ah." so, you know, when, when something is just causing a little bit of stress or anxiety in our lives, we can weigh the benefits and say, run my entire business online. We even have a hypnosis app, right? So people are using (laughs) their cell phones to get the hypnosis, but when it becomes debilitating, where it's impacting negatively other areas of your life. It could be impacting your health, your friends, your relationship. Your spouse could be annoyed that every time you have a conversation, you're chronically checking the phone or levels of anxiety and even depression are on the rise. You have to say, okay, enough is enough. What are we going to do? So what we found is a protocol that the very first thing we need to do is bring awareness to the use of the cell phone. Because it's a reason why they call it mindlessly scrolling. We don't realize we're doing it. We're not mindful as to the fact that we have even been on the device for as long as we have. So the first session is typically bringing awareness at the subconscious level every time you go to grab for the phone. Because if you can become aware of this, then you can stop and make a decision. Do I actually want 
to scroll or not. And this is something that we've used a lot with nail biting to great success. Um, You know, our fingers aren't going anywhere. So it tends to be a little more complicated (laughs) to end nail biting than something like smoking. When you're done smoking, you throw away the cigarettes, you get rid of the ashtray, you're not holding the lighter. It's Mm -hmm. simple. With nail biting, that trigger and the device through which you're processing anxiety are attached to you. So we had to bring awareness to every time the fingers were coming up to the mouth. So we did the same thing with cell phones with great success. Then we have to let the subconscious know the downside of using the cell phone because the subconscious, I know this might sound a little woo woo, but truly it's a survival mechanism. will never do anything to try to hurt us. It's always trying to help us. Even with smoking, when you do a, a session in hypnosis about smoking, for example, you find out well, why, why is the smoker smoking? It's always something like, it's protecting me from people bothering me on the street. It's how I release stress. It's how I get out of the office. And so we have to let the subconscious know the downside of chronic cell phone use. And, you know, there's so many different downsides to it. And once the subconscious knows this isn't entirely a positive, it actually will have less of a desire to do it in the first place. And then the third step to this protocol is imagining feeling safe, calm, and even productive without chronically checking the phone. So then we're creating a neural framework of experience before you actually physically do it so that you can build upon that. Because right now, if I were to say, everyone listening, imagine not having your cell phone for the next 24 hours, it would be difficult to imagine an anxiety inducing. So by imagining it on the subconscious level that you get through whatever length of time you personally want to set up, whether it's two hours without the cell phone in the afternoon, whether it's only checking it three times a day at dedicated times, or whether it's turning it off for the whole weekend, Um, imagining that outcome and feeling calm and safe and even productive during those hours has been very effective. So that's really helpful to understand. I wonder if you could give us either some examples or make a little bit more concrete for us how hypnosis uh, is involved in the kind of steps you talked about. Absolutely. So I'll give an example of a client I was working with not too long ago who had experienced anxiety throughout his entire life. And so he he really hadn't ever considered hypnosis for the use of his overarching experience with anxiety, but he did come to it for specifically addiction to cell phone use. And what was really lovely is he was able to experience a decrease in anxiety overall. Um, and decrease the use of the cell phone and the obsession with needing to use it. So the way hypnosis works is we don't focus on the problem. And I, that is why that statistic I shared with you at first, the 600 sessions for 33% improvement versus the six mm-hmm. sessions of hypnotherapy for 93% improvement. The reason we're getting there so fast is because you're entering down into that theta brainwave state and we're not strengthening the issue by talking about it. When we get together with our friends and complain about our day, as cathartic as it might feel in the short term, we know that neurons that fire together wire together. So when we work ourselves up and get all angry talking about what our boss did again and again and tell the same story again and again, we're actually strengthening those connections in the brain and making it more likely that we'll feel that way again in future. It's not improving anything. So if someone comes to me and says, I want to work on my cell phone addiction, I'll say, great. Tell me briefly in a few minutes what the problem is. Okay, now how do you want to feel instead? How do you want to behave instead? That's the crux of what we're focused on. Then there's something called an induction. And this is why hypnosis can be very powerful for even people who struggle with meditating on their own. It's because you're guided down into the theta brainwave state. So there's many different ways to do this, but a lot of times it includes progressively relaxing the body from the head to the toes. Imagining walking down a staircase is a really beautiful visualization that has a correlation to actually relaxing. (laughs) Um, And then when we get down there, when you're in the theta brainwave state, it's actually your most resourceful state. It's where you have the least amount of inhibition and where you're the most creative. 
And so the thoughts that you might have consciously where, oh, that's stupid or that would never work or that's been done before, I could never do it. They're gone in hypnosis. Actually, Thomas Edison used hypnosis. He would put himself into the theta brainwave state holding metal balls in his hand and he would have a metal pan on the ground beneath his hand. So if he dropped too deep from theta down to delta, which is sleep, he would drop the balls into the pan and it would wake him up. And he did this because as an inventor, he needed to be able to go to that place where the critical voice is silent. And as you mentioned, Robert, it's very subtle after the fact. Um, the improvements are subtle. It's not like you're trying to not use the phone and you, you can. It's not like your willpower increases. It's just that your desire to pick it up isn't there. That's great. And one of you could talk a little bit about self-hypnosis, which you've mentioned a couple of times, including now uh, with Thomas Edison, because uh, that's something I think a lot of people are are much less familiar with. I'm certainly not very familiar with it. Most of my exposure to the idea of hypnosis has been through someone else guiding you into the into the hypnotic state and and through the whole process. What you know, how does self hypnosis work? How can people learn it? And you know, are there any differences in it, um, benefits or disadvantages of it relative to working with someone else? Sure. So early on in my book, which is you know about self-hypnosis. It's called Close Your Eyes, Get Free. I have a chart that shows the benefits versus length of time versus cost in the different ways you can experience hypnosis. So one-on-one -on -one private hypnotherapy sessions is the most effective. You see the results the fastest. It's also the most expensive because it's one-on-one -on -one with a trained professional. Um, the next spot down would be recordings like on our Grace Space Hypnosis app or in our inner circle. We have all these, you know, we're going to have thousands of recordings. Eventually, we already have dozens and dozens for every topic you could imagine. And those are relatively inexpensive. However, by the nature of the fact that they're recording, they are general. They're not going to be specific to you and your subconscious programming. They're going to be picking up on themes. Now, self-hypnosis is the least expensive because it's free. And you can do it anytime, any place without needing your phone, which is lovely, um, or headphones or anything like that. Um, but it does take the longest amount of time simply because it's not like you have a professional there guiding you to transform limiting beliefs. You're doing it yourself through the use of hypno affirmations. So what I love about self-hypnosis is it's a pattern interrupt. As those neurons in your brain go to fire and go to wire together again, you can stop them in the moment. So let's say, for example, you use a hypnosis recording to make you more aware of when you're going to pick up your phone. Um, that's absolutely wonderful and lovely. But if you don't want to listen to that recording, what you can do with self-hypnosis is get yourself into the theta brainwave state quickly, easily, we're talking two, three minutes tops, repeating a hypno affirmation in your mind that you would develop something like, I am safe, I am calm, I am happy without needing to scroll. It can literally be that simple <laughs> and clear. Um, and you will change your behavior in that moment. Now, self-hypnosis can't be used to, let's say, for example, heal a trauma from childhood, because you're not going to go back there and do regression therapy yourself. But if any anxieties or fears came up in your day-to-day -day life as a result of childhood trauma, you can stop those feelings in the moment and change your state with self-hypnosis. So that's why I wrote Close Your Eyes, Get Free. Because I said, if I'm going to make hypnosis mainstream, that means everybody, uh, no matter what your financial situation is, having the access and ability to tap into your subconscious, which really is your mainframe. That's great. I appreciate that you mentioned your book. Uh, we will give people links to it and more information about how to find uh, find you and get in touch with you directly. You know, a lot of this does sound similar to me to um, the process of guided meditation. I know you said early on, if I'm remembering you correctly, that hypnosis is like meditation plus a goal, uh, if that's fair. But for those people who are listening who may be more familiar with either guided meditation or self-meditation, could you talk a little bit more about how hypnosis may be similar to or different than meditation? Sure. So I would say that guided meditation is hypnosis. 
And the key difference is if someone who is a hypnotherapist is doing the session or the recording, then that means that they've trained in you know at least hundreds of hours in understanding the subconscious and how to reprogram it. Whereas a typical guided meditation might be more about just relaxing your stress in the moment um, momentarily. But for example, the subconscious does not hear negative words. So if someone were to say to you, you never eat chocolate again. What the subconscious here is, hears is you eat chocolate again. And this is just a very simple example of what someone who didn't study the therapy would never know and could actually be making the issue worse. So, um, you know, think about meditation as a form of breathing deeply, coming back to your breath, allowing yourself to detach from thoughts clouds in the sky, uh, mindfulness, then they are pretty different. But in terms of guided meditation, what a lot of people will say is, oh, a hypnotherapy session or a hypnosis recording feels so much like guided meditation, but I saw even greater transformation. And I would say that the difference there is because we're focused on the goal we're not focused on the experience. I think a lot of times when people listen to guided meditation, they're going there to feel like they meditated, not necessarily to stop eating chocolate or stop biting their nails or overcome a fear of public speaking or to love being on planes. Whereas with hypnosis, people don't come to it for the experience. They come to it for the result. And the hypnotherapist is trained to help you get the result because they're an expert in your subconscious. Hmm. I wonder if you could talk then about uh, you know what is involved in the uh, repetition of the, uh, hypnosis over time. You know, you mentioned that you can achieve a goal more quickly, let, let's say, than using other methods. But what what's actually going on with the repetition? Is it merely kind of cementing uh, what you got the first time in the in the first hypnotherapy session, or is there some kind of progression you're moving through? You know, what why is there a need for many sessions, and what goes on as you're progressing through? Uh, some number of hypnotherapy sessions. Sure. So let's say someone's coming to work on increasing their confidence. And when they come to their very first session, they're very much lacking in confidence. They are judgmental of themselves. They don't speak up at the office. They're worried about what everyone's thinking. They don't take the trips they want to take. It's manifesting in an area of their life as lack of confidence. So in session one, Primarily, too, we're doing a lot of educating because a lot of times people still come thinking they're going to get blacked out and knocked out and they're not going to remember a thing. And they're terrified because they want the result, but they think it's going to be scary. So we have to educate up front so that there's clear expectations on what the session will be like. And then you're setting a framework of experience. So beginning to imagine what it might feel like to be confident. Then they come back, and if you think six sessions on average result in 93% improvement, that's anywhere from around you know, 10 15% improvement per session. So now they're coming back 15% more confident. And what you want to do is anchor that in. So you say, okay, what were the experiences you had where you felt more confident? Wonderful. Let's anchor that in. Now you experience that again in the subconscious level. Now let's go back to where maybe that lack of confidence began. And you'll do some regression therapy, which invariably, 99% of the time you were five or six years old maybe a teacher made fun of your drawing in front of the whole class and you just shut down and I, I say that not to be flippant I say it because it's so common it's so common that before the age of seven years old we were embarrassed in some way shape or form and it set the course for all the neuroses we have as an adult mm -hmm. and if we go back and clean that up so much like a domino effect um, is improved upon now they're going to come back 30 to 40% more confident. Okay, great. Now you're going to visualize yourself doing something you've never done before. Maybe it's, you know, being the keynote speaker at the quarterly summit. And now you're going to envision yourself preparing and doing this and doing that. So, you know, I think a lot of times people think hypnosis is magic and that it's either going to work or not work. And that would be if we expected it to all take place in one session. But what we have to realize is we're actually creating a new neural network in the brain, a new way to experience life. And that does take some time, but luckily you can still knock it out in, you know, the average of six sessions, which 
you know, that's six weeks of somebody's life to have a totally different experience after the fact. So it's been working from session to session, but it's definitely progressing over time too. That's really helpful for clarifying how the process of hypnotherapy works. You know, we, we, you've talked a little bit about applying it directly to things like internet addiction or gaming addiction or other kinds of unhealthy habits that people have in connection with technology. I'm wondering if there are uh, different types of situations where hypnotherapy works better or worse than others. Like just a couple of things that were coming to my mind were I think some of the situations you were talking about, I would think of as improvements in um, attitude, uh, like confidence. Um, I wonder if, if hypnotherapy applies also to improving skills, you know, learning how to perform specific tasks aside from having a, a helpful attitude for performing them. And, you know, in my experience, using technology more healthily, more productively uh, can sometimes involve a mix of those two things. I'm so glad you asked. Yeah. Hypnosis can be used to improve upon anything that resides in the subconscious that happens automatically in the background. So that means habits, beliefs, emotional responses, physical responses. Hypnosis has shown to have an 83% improvement rate for IBS. So, you know, there was a study that, a study that came out of Harvard that showed that the use of hypnosis healed bones 40% faster. So certainly improvement in mindset, but improvement in not only this, these physical reactions in your body, but one of the things that my clients who are primarily CEOs or actors or athletes at the top of their game is they realize that to be the very, very best in their field and when they're competing with at that point, had the same resources, put in the time. Now it really comes down to something that's mental, you know, what's happening beneath the surface, getting rid of the self-sabotage in order to perform better. So there might be a lot of people who are saying, I want to use my Fitbit in order to get out there and run. Why won't I just run? I want to run. Why won't I just run? And there could be some, and there likely is, subconscious self-sabotage going on that believes it's better for you to not run. It thinks the reward is greater if you don't run. And it's totally wrong, but until you go in there and have that conversation with the subconscious, it becomes difficult to even take the steps you so have a desire to take through your life. Does, does that answer your question? It does. It does. And I wonder, are there any common sabotaging beliefs uh, or attitudes you found that people have in connection with technology, you know, that that might resonate with people who are listening and particularly if they're not currently aware of those beliefs? <laughs> <You know. laughs> yes. Well, the first thing I want everyone to know is that procrastination is the most requested topic across everything we offer. Um, so that's something that I just think even technology aside for a moment is important to everyone know that procrastination is not a sign of laziness. It's a fear of failure. And to remember that, because if you're not taking action on something you wanted to take action on, it's very likely that the subconscious belief is that if you were to do that, it could be possible to fail. And that failure would be worse than not doing it at all. Again, doesn't make conscious sense, but the subconscious is there to keep you alive and safe, which a lot of times means keeping you small and hidden. And we have to reprogram the brain to realize there isn't a tiger lurking around every corner now. It's okay <laughs> for us to go for the big, bold lives we want. With technology, the biggest fear that I've seen come up again and again. Well, there's two. One is fear of being disconnected, like, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out truly mm -hmm. though, not knowing what's happening in the world. And two, fear of falling behind at work, not doing as well, not being as successful. And that's for entrepreneurs just as much as people in corporate because social media for entrepreneurs is a lot of times linked to their business success. And, you know, if you're not checking every one of those notifications on Slack, then are you going to be up for that next management promotion? So we have to realize that when you're saying to yourself, I want to use my phone less, if your conscious thinks it's going to disconnect you from the world, make you isolate and alone, which is 
so interesting because really the inverse is typically what's happening Mm -hmm. or that you're going to fall behind in life. Of course, the self-sabotage is going to come up and let you do it. So you got to get in there with subconscious um, hypnosis into the subconscious to say, hey, this is how it really is. This is what I really want. I'm just talking about having greater control over my actions and the way I spend my time. It's interesting you mentioned the, the, the two kinds of fears uh, in relation to technology. You know, with respect to fear of failing, uh, I've tried to do things uh, consciously to address that in myself. And the podcast is actually a good example where people have asked me, oh, you know, what is the best thing to do for me to start running my own podcast? And I say the best way to start is to start. You know, just just decide to do it and start going and then pay attention to your experience as you inevitably feel like I did, that it could have been better. Uh, You know, there's something you don't know how to do. Uh, I launched the podcast without really studying how to do podcasting, uh, practicing for it, which is normally the way I would start on a new project is to probably way over prepare. Uh, and so I, I launched the podcast. One of my motivations was to practice, um, engaging in something, knowing I would feel that fear of not doing well in it. And then no, uh, intentionally plan to pay attention to how I felt. And in retrospect, I know I've noticed uh, the sky didn't fall, the world didn't end, and things have gone really well. But I, I wonder, you know, when you say you in hypnotherapy help people draw the subconscious atten- uh, attention of the subconscious to this, I wonder what is the, what is the difference there but, you know, between doing what I, at least for myself, thought of as drawing my conscious attention to the field fear repeatedly and then finding that it subs- would subside. What's the difference between that and drawing the attention of the subconscious to the fear? That's a really great question. And one of my favorite hypno affirmations is done is better than perfect. So I couldn't agree with you more, especially <laughs> for entrepreneurs. You just got to do it. Go. Um, so there's a lot of people in the world who consciously can will themselves to do things like you did and start your podcast, even if it was scary or terrifying, or you didn't know what to expect, or even just a little bit uncomfortable. There are a lot of people in the world, though, who desperately want to create a podcast and are so nervous about it and overthinking it so much and so terrified that they will never even record their first episode. Or they'll record three episodes and never launch them because they're so, and they might not even have the conscious thought as to why. It's more like, oh, it just doesn't seem like the good time. Oh, I never got around to it. Oh, I couldn't figure out the editing software. But really, it never goes out into the world. And what that means is that the self-sabotage mechanisms are hard at play and they're doing a really good job. And hypnosis would really benefit this person to get that first step done. And then as you notice, consciously, the sky didn't fall, the world didn't end. It was great (laughs) to anchor that into the subconscious and to know it and feel it truly in your body makes it that much easier to go bigger and bolder. So I'll give an example of a, a friend whose podcast I was just on. She did a hypnosis session with me and she said, I'm about to interview someone I admire so much who is really famous and I've been following them my whole life and I'm terrified. And she'd done 200 podcast interviews at that point, but she was shaking in her boots about this person coming up. She had imposter syndrome, like who am I to interview this person? So even though she'd gotten as far as she wanted, sometimes we reach a threshold where we're like, I should be okay. I should be able to enjoy this. I should be able to feel confident going in, but I don't. And then hypnosis was able to help her feel not only confident, but excited about the opportunity. And she killed it. She loved it. She emailed me, said, this is amazing. I feel unstoppable. So some people are able to take the first step without hypnosis and that's great, but then need it later to go even further. Some need it from the very beginning. And it's always um, a dance. You know, one more example I'll give. Public speaking is a fear for so many. Um, And I'll say to someone, you know, you can't just do hypnosis to feel confident speaking in public. 
and that be it and just mm-hmm. enjoy these beautiful speeches in your brain. No, you have to then go and speak. So it is a combination between what you're doing with your eyes closed during your session and going out and actually physically speaking. And then once you speak, coming back and doing a session to say, I did the speech, the sky didn't fall. I didn't turn bright red. I didn't die. No one booed me off. It's going to be great. And going back again with that greater level of confidence the next time. That's that's really helpful. I mean, it, sound, it sounds like you're saying, one, uh, what is helpful to people is going to vary a lot depending on who they are, where they are at the moment, what they need, and that there may be a combination of approaches that are helpful to them and that that may even change and evolve over time. Exactly. Another reason why the private sessions are always the the most powerful is because it's unique to you. You know, since my most of my clients are at the very top of their game, they're already wildly successful, but it doesn't mean they don't have things to work on. That's certainly <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so uh, everybody is coming to you know the plate from a very different background and and we take it from where you are and where you want to be. That's great. Uh, th- thanks so much for giving us uh, this quite different perspective than what we've had before uh, using hypnotherapy and hypnosis to address problems with technology and, and other other issues that people want to address. Can you just uh, tell people uh, about how they can find out more about you, your books, uh, your services, and, and get in touch with you? Absolutely. And actually, Robert, do you want to do a little mini one or do you want to just... Yeah, we can do this. Is this something that you, that people listening will be able to follow along with? Yes. Okay, great. The only people I would say who should not follow along right now are if you're driving, obviously, because we're going to go <laughs> deep into a meditative state. So if you're driving, come back and listen to this next bit at a later time. For everyone else, go ahead and notice your starting stress level. Zero is zero stress, no stress at all, the most relaxed a person can possibly be. And 10 is a full-blown panic attack, the most stressed a person can possibly be. And now go ahead and notice your stress number when I say you are not able to use your phone for the next 24 hours. And Robert, what would be your starting number on the scale? The starting number was a two. Mm-hmm. And I'd say, can't use my phone, goes up to uh, four or five. Okay, perfect. So we'll say you're starting at a 4.5. Similarly, I was probably about a three and I went up to a six with the no phone. So everybody go ahead and close your eyes. Remembering the number that has to do with the idea of not using your phone for the next 24 hours. As you take a nice, deep, letting go breath, Already beginning to relax both mind and body. Relax the top of your head. Relax your forehead, smoothing out any creases. Relax the tiny muscles next to your eyes. Relax your jaw, letting it hang loose and slack. And as you create space in your jaw, you send a message to the rest of your body that it's safe for you to relax. And I wonder now how much you can relax your entire body, even your right wrist, even your left toes. Go ahead and begin to imagine now a color you love forming at the top of your head and say that color to yourself silently. Now imagine that color like a waterfall flowing in through the top of your head all the way through your body, out the bottoms of your feet, down into the center of the earth. And as that color washes through you, It washes away any stress, washes away any strain, washes away any fears. And as that color flows through you, you begin to feel lighter, 
cleaner and clearer. Repeat in your mind after me. Three, I am going deeper and deeper. Two, I am going deeper and deeper. One, I am going deeper and deeper. Once again, saying that color you love to yourself and allowing that color to flow in through the top of your head all the way through your body, out the bottoms of your feet. And repeating in your mind after me, I am safe. I am calm. I choose to be here. Twice more, I am safe. I am calm. I choose to be here. I am safe. I am calm. I choose to be here. Now go ahead and just begin to imagine spending the rest of your day doing something you love, something that feels good, something productive even, without the use of your phone. And as you imagine this now, you continue to feel safe. You continue to feel calm. Good. Now go ahead and put a smile on your lips, gently opening your eyes. And Robert, what number are you on now? I'm back down to a two, and I think it's only because I'm aware of my need to finish up the podcast and have something to say. <laughs> mm -hmm. Excellent. Really good. So you can see then if your base level is a two, which is great, and yet something were to spike it up, then you can use self-hypnosis to pattern interrupt to get back down to a level that's comfortable. And for those of you who are listening, there's going to be such a wide range of experience. Some of you will have gone from an eight to a zero and you'll say, oh my God, where has this been my whole life? Some of you might have gone from a nine to a seven and say, oh good, I'm glad that I went down by two, but it's not enough. And what that means is rewind, go back, listen to it again, back to back. That was about four minutes in length. And you'll go next time from a seven to maybe a four, and then maybe from a four to a one. And so then in just a few minutes, you go from a chronic, nearly panic attack level to something that is beyond manageable. It's actually comfortable. Um, so it's just a little taste to get people realizing how deeply safe and relaxed they feel. No blackouts, no mind control, no swinging watches. <laughs> and uh, to encourage you that if you enjoyed that at all, even a little bit, to, to take your investigation deeper and to experience it some more. Well, thanks so much for sharing that with us and for giving people the opportunity to experience uh, hypnosis, as you said, uh, for what it really is, not the kind of mythical Hollywood or <laughs> stage show version of it. And uh, what can people do to uh, find out more about you and get in touch with you? Absolutely. So everything is at gshypnosis.com. There you can purchase private hypnotherapy sessions, either with myself or one of the incredible hypnotherapists I've trained. We've got every recording under the sun you could imagine and always more coming out. Our app, if you are going to use your phone in a mindful way, um, Grace Face Hypnosis app is wonderful. And of course, my book, Close your eyes, get free, use self-hypnosis to reduce stress, quit bad habits, and achieve greater relaxation and focus can be found in all major retailers. And one other fun way, if you are going to use your phone mindfully, and if you are going to scroll mindfully, uh, we do live group hypnosis on my Instagram account quite often, and that's at Grace Smith TV. Well, thanks so much for letting us know all those ways people can uh, learn more from you, get in touch with you, and start to explore hypnosis. So, Grace, thanks so much for being on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast. Thank you so much for having me. It's been such a pleasure. Thanks for joining us for this Technology for Mindfulness podcast with me, Robert Plotkin, and today's guest, Grace Smith, a hypnotherapist and author of the book on self-hypnosis, Close Your Eyes, Get Free. You can find out more about Grace at her website, gshypnosis.com. 
If you liked today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and share the episode with your friends. Those and all other links are in the show notes and check out our blog at technologyformindfulness.com for information and tips about science, technology, and mindfulness. And find out about our Tap Into Mindfulness course for helping you to take control of your smartphone at bit.ly slash TFM meditation. I'm Robert Plotkin, and I'll join you next time on the Technology for Mindfulness podcast with Kelly Reese, a former CEO turned life coach who's on a mission to motivate, empower, and inspire courageous women to navigate resistance and uncertainty in their lives.